Okay, guys. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Happy Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> Did it scare you? Is that what you were saying? All those people coming to your door? <laughs> okay, so hopefully everybody had a happy Halloween yesterday. Got a lot of candy. Got a lot of studying, yeah. I saw you were online very late last night. Yeah. Okay, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, everybody came to hear me talk today, not each other, right? So, yeah, so we might as well get started with listening to me, right? Okay, so if you recall, um, last time we uh, talked about reaction rate, uh, this was the problem uh, that was given at the end of lecture last time. Okay, so a solid, a solid sodium was put into pure water. All the sodium had reacted after eight seconds. Um, and the concentration was found to be 0 .0013 uh, molar. How do you figure out uh, this problem? So let's go ahead and figure out, well, what's the average rate here? All right, so what does the formula say? So it says the concentration of A2 minus the concentration of A1. So concentration A2. So this is concentration of A at time 2 minus the concentration of A at time 1. And remember, this is the general reaction. A goes to B, so we're looking at um, the reactants here. Okay, and we want to do change of time, so we're going to do time 2 minus time 1. And then we say whoops. Time one like that. And then let's figure out what these variables are. So what's Concentration A1, what is that going to be? Does anybody know? Since everybody did this problem over the weekend, like we were supposed to, right? Um, everybody should be telling me what's going on. So what's concentration A1? Okay, good job, guys. So why don't you guys do this on your own? Um, and uh, we'll go over it tomorrow when you guys can tell me what the answers of this are, okay? Okay, so let's start talking about reaction mechanism then. Uh, so a reaction mechanism is stepwise changes that reactants undergo in their conversion to products. Okay, I'll show you a reaction mechanism. And we want to think about, uh, so I'll erase this stuff. So if we think about reactions going from A to B, okay, um, we briefly mentioned this at the end of last period, um, that a reaction going to A and B, that's just like watching a, a race, but not watching what happens in the middle. That's only watching what happens at the beginning of the race and at the end of the race. So it's like two snapshots, like what's the starting order, and who won, okay? But um, a lot of interesting stuff could happen in between uh, the beginning and the end of a race, right? <clears throat> I can imagine like, um, I don't know, like a NASCAR race or something like that. Probably people watch it more often than not to see what happens in between what happens at the starting and the ending point, right? They, they, they enjoy watching what happens in the middle, okay? 
Yeah, people wreck, right? Um, so that would be like the reaction mechanism, okay? So what we've been showing so far is just watching, okay, so this is what happened at the beginning, this is what happened at the end. That's not very interesting, okay? So let's start talking about what happened in the middle, okay? So what could happen in the middle is A could go to like intermediate 1, and then intermediate 1 could go to intermediate 2. Intermediate 2 could go to intermediate 3, so on and so forth, until we get to B. Okay? So, if we just took these two snapshots, we wouldn't know anything about intermediate 1, 2, and 3. Okay? Just to beat a dead horse. Right? Okay, so... The stepwise changes that the reactants undergo on their way to conversion to products. So a reaction mechanism often is expressed as a number of processes that must take place for these reactions to occur. <clears throat> so we've got to make a few assumptions when we're talking about reactions. Okay? So the first assumption is that the reactant particles must collide with one another in order for a reaction to occur. Okay, they can't just shout at each other and react. Okay, they actually have to come into contact with each other with enough speed to smash into each other, break bonds and form bonds. Okay, so the reactant particles must collide with one another in order for the reaction to occur. This, of course, is if you have two reactant particles. For a decomposition reaction, of course, you're only going to have one reactant, right? So you don't need it to smash into anything else. You just need to give it enough energy to, for those bonds to break. Okay? This is the assumption that we're talking about if we have something more than one reactant. Right? But anyway, so molecules can't react with each other if they don't come into contact with each other. And during collisions, some bonds are broken, atoms are exchanged, and new bonds are formed. Okay, let's look at a proper reaction mechanism. So, we'll look at um, <coughs> bromomethane um, reacting with sodium hydroxide to make methanol. Okay? Let's look at this reaction. So, you guys remember what a wedge bond means? Right? Okay. And a dash bond, you know that too, right? <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, so the reaction that I'm going to write here is going to be CH3Br. This is the liquid. Plus NaOH. Uh, we can make this aqueous. Goes to CH3OH plus N A whoops C O H liquid plus N A B R. Aqueous is good enough for me. Okay? So when we put NaOH into water, everybody probably understands, hopefully, that it's going to dissolve into water, breaking into its two constituent ions, N A and O H. Okay? Um so, if you really wanted to think about it, that would be the first step of the reaction mechanism, but not the reaction mechanism proper, okay? Because the OH is the only thing that really reacts there. So, we're going to have floating around in solution Na plus ions <coughs> and OH minus ions. Like that. Here, let's just draw this bond out. Okay, so this reaction that we're about to do is not like this reaction, where there's one, two, three, four, five, or whatever steps. Okay, this is a one step reaction. But you can actually see the reaction mechanism. So, what's going to happen 
is the electrons on this oxygen are going to want to attack that carbon there, smash into it, like that, and knock this bond off. But you can really, this really emphasizes what happens. We're making a bond and we're breaking a bond. Okay, so let's look at the way that we've made the bond and broke the bond. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that we've made a bond in between this oxygen and that carbon. Okay, we've also broken a bond between that carbon and that bromine. We broke that bond there. Okay, so this is a one step mechanism. All that happens is the one piece re smashes into the other piece and knocking the third piece away, okay? So can everybody see what's going on here and see how we're describing what is actually happening during the reaction as opposed to just saying what we've set up here, this, now this, okay? So now we're actually saying this is how <coughs> this molecule came into being, right? That makes sense, right? Okay. <laughs> this is like a boxing match, right? Instead of just watching two people stand here and then one person fall down, right? Or one person on the ground, you can see the actual punch that happened, okay? To knock the person down. This would be the punch that happened, okay? Okay. So, here we're seeing here the reactant particles collide with one another. These arrows are describing the motion of these reactant particles. We're showing the bonds being broken right here. We see this bond is being broken. We see this bond is being formed. Okay, so we uh, also assume that the reactant particles collide with a certain amount of energy so the reaction will occur if they don't if you it's like in the boxing match if the guy just taps the other guy it's not going to fall down right so you got to have enough energy to knock the guy out um, and in some cases reacting particles must be oriented in a specific way for the reaction to occur so like for this reaction this reaction only will occur if this oxygen hits this carbon at this spot. If this oxygen <coughs> came over here whoops, and ran into that bromine right there, this reaction wouldn't occur, okay? Because this oxygen wants to make a bond with this carbon. If it's hitting it here, it can't make a, the reaction. It's like the boxing uh, analogy again, right? If the boxer that wanted to win hit the other boxer on his foot, right, probably wouldn't knock him out, okay? So you got to hit him in the right spot, okay? Not in the little toe, okay? So what we've just described is known as an effective collision, okay? So at all temperatures above absolute zero, bonded atoms of molecules vibrate and stretch, okay? So what happens is you can see the bond here. This is the average length of the bond. But when you've got some sort of temperature involved, they kind of stretch and bend and do all weird stuff, okay? But they don't stretch enough to where the bond breaks, okay? So a bond is like kind of like, um, I don't know, uh, like a spider web or something that you, that you get stuck to your hand, right? So when you get stuck to your hand, right, you pull it and pull it and pull it until it breaks, okay? And that's when the reaction occurs, okay? But what happens is they can pull and stretch and bend without actually breaking, okay? And this is the 
actual total energy that the molecule actually has within it. Okay, so when we talked about bonds being stored chemical energy, that's what they're doing is using that energy just bouncing back and forth. Okay. Kind of, not really though. Uh, metal is not covalent bonded together. Okay, so you got to think of things that are covalently bonded together. That's why the ozone layer shields us from UV radiation in the sun. Is because when the sun's UV radiation hits that ozone, it, instead of you know breaking to form oxygen, what happens? It just stretches a little bit and then goes back. So it absorbs that energy. Okay, so this is covalent bonding we're talking about, not metallic bonding or ionic bonding. Okay. This is also like why uh, you see colors. Okay, so the colors are um, absorbing that light and then reflecting, reflecting the light that they're not absorbing back, and that's the colors. Like your shirt's not absorbing purple, and your shirt's not absorbing green. Okay, that's why we see those colors. Okay, but this is what happens in covalent molecules. They stretch and bend and do all this stuff. So they have a certain amount of internal energy is what we call that. Okay, this internal energy can be increased by collisions. Okay, so it's just like you can imagine, um, you know, you can pull something apart harder or push it together harder and that's giving it even more energy. Okay. So this results in more vibration, more vibration, more vibration until the thing actually breaks. Okay. Um, so if it breaks, then we call that a reaction. Okay. So it's not anything special. We have all these special names for all of this mundane things that actually are happening. Okay. So if we look at this reaction here, um, CH4 and O2 are the reactants. So we'll do a less detailed analysis than we have done here. So we got CH4. Notice this is the Lewis structure that I'm drawing here. And O2, like that. Okay, well, we've got two O2 molecules. Like that. We call it a reaction. Right? Okay, so what happens Whoops. CO2 H2O Okay, so plus some energy. Okay. So, are these molecules on the left side of this arrow the same as on the right side of the arrow? No. What about everybody else that said, didn't say anything? <laughs> no. no, right? So hopefully everybody can see that the left side and the right side are different, okay? So, but what is the same on the left and the right side? What is the same? 
So the element specifically what? That there is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? Okay, that's the same. What else is the same? The number of the, the specifically, yeah, that's what I was looking for, right? Is that the number of atoms, the particular atoms, is the same on the left and the right side of the equation, right? But what's different about them? Yeah, so there, so uh, another way to say that, right, maybe in uh, more layman's type terms, is that uh, they're arranged differently, right. right? They're all arranged differently. Okay, so what must have happened from going from here to here? Bonds, bonds had to be broken in this thing here, right? Because there's none of that stuff over here. Right? And since there's only one carbon here and one carbon here, we know that that carbon must have had some oxygens react with it, right? And also have those hydrogens somehow fall off of it. And those hydrogens, since they're not attached to that carbon anymore but are attached to this oxygens over here, something must have happened, right? So, like was said, bonds were, must have been destroyed and created or broken and formed, right? Yeah. So, in this case, the CH single bond was broken and the O double bond was broken. O2 double bond was broken. And the C double bond O was formed and the OH bond was formed too. So, energy is required to break the bonds. We'll talk about this in more detail in a second. This energy comes from the collision of the molecules. Okay? So it's just like the collision of the boxer's hand to the jaw of the other boxer. That gives the energy to knock the guy out. Right? The energy that comes from the, or the, is necessary to break those bonds comes from the things smashing into each other. Okay? And we call this an effective collision. Okay, so why does any reaction occur? Okay, so this is, w is the next question. Why do these reactions occur to begin with? Can anybody think of a reason why reactions occur? There's no wrong answers right now. Well, I mean, there's wrong answers, but don't worry about it. <laughs> but don't worry about getting them wrong, okay? So, can anybody think of any reason why a reaction would occur? Okay, so, okay, yeah, so, okay. I, I see what, well, the, the, you guys are thinking of things in a different way than I am. So, you're thinking, if I've got some stuff here, how do I make these things react? That's the way you're thinking. I'm thinking generally, okay? So why, why will they react if they're there? Kind of, yeah, that's one kind of reason. They, they'll hit each other, yeah, that's kind of that temperature thing again, but... Okay, so... And that's all right. That's all right. Okay. So, in the universe, I think we've talked about this, that things always want to go down in energy. Okay? So, since, uh, if you, I guess, if I want to say it right, um, if I've got a couple of things that will react together, okay, the reason that they'll react together is because the thing that they'll form is going to be at a lower overall energy state than they are already. Okay? So, that's what's being shown right here. Okay? So, normally you'll see reactions, spontaneous reactions specifically, where the reactant's overall energy 
is significantly higher than the product's overall energy. Okay? So, it's like, why does something fall down? Why doesn't it, if I just put this here, why does it just stay there? Yeah, but I mean gravity. What it, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Tell me more about gravity. What is happening here? Huh? Okay, so it's an attractive force, right? There's an attractive force. So, okay, so do I have um, more attraction that when I'm way up here or more attraction when I'm up here or down here? Well, it's what, it, what happens when it gets to the center? Then that must be the le least attractive force. Is that what you're saying? If that's the least attractive force, wouldn't they bounce away from each other? If it's the least amount of attraction, that's like, what's the most amount of attraction? It's like when they're stuck together, right? That's going to be the most amount of attraction, right? If they're... Things that are not attracted to each other, if they're like next to each other, what do they do? They bounce, bounce away from each other, right? Okay. Yeah, so it wants to go this way, right? So it's like if I have a positive and a negative thing, what's going to happen? They're going to want to stick together, right? It's the same kind of thing with gravity, although it's not a positive negative thing, okay? So why is that? Why does it go from here to here? How about that? Let's talk about energy. Yeah, how is it releasing energy? So what is this when from here to here? The difference is what? This has more what kind of energy? No, not gravity. This energy, this energy. What is it called? What are the two kinds of energy? How about that? Kinetic and potential energy. Okay. What are, we, what are we talking about in this um, chapter? What are we talking about in this chapter? Kinetics. Okay, so what is that the study of? No, <laughs> we've talked about this. Okay, what's kinetics? Don't get guess. What's kinetics the study of? Okay, and when we're talking well, kinetics specifically is the to topic of rates okay rates okay so potential or kinetic energy do you think this has so where is the kinetic energy when I'm talking about potential and kinetic energy of this system okay so <laughs> okay but so what's this got very high and this has got low what High potential energy. Why? Because it could potentially fall down, right? That's why it's got high potential energy. That's all it means, okay? <laughs> kinetics is the study of what? Rates. Okay, so you could kind of think its kinetic energy is increasing as it's falling, okay? Okay, when it's doing stuff, when you're doing stuff, your kinetic energy increases. Does that make sense? That should make sense to you, okay? If you don't know what the stu what chapter we're talking, what we're talking about in the chapter, then it's probably going. Everything I'm saying is probably not registering. Okay? And text messaging probably won't help you find the answer either. But anyways, okay. So what you want to always think of. I'm serious. A lot of people think text messaging does help them find the answer. Anyways, what you want to think of is that the reactants are always going to be, or not always, in spontaneous reactions, reactants are going to be at a higher energy level than products. Why, why do reactions want to occur? How about that? Let's, let's ask this question again. Why do reactions want to occur? Yeah, because they want to be at a lower energy, or the products are more stable than the reactants, or the reactants are more what than the products? Unstable or energetic, right? Okay, so they have more energy associated with them. 
Okay, so let's look at, so we're going to start writing reaction diagrams or potential energy diagrams. Okay, the same thing, reaction diagrams, potential energy diagrams. When we have a spontaneous reaction, the reactants are going to be up here, the products are going to be down there, and we're going to lose energy. When we lose energy, do you remember I said this thing at the end has energy also? That little triangle is my little campfire symbol for energy, okay? Okay, so what's happening in this reaction? When I say it's giving off energy, what do you think is what I'm, what am I feeling? Heat, heat, right? This is like, if you do this reaction, you can boil water, right? Because this is the reaction of the Bunsen burner, okay? Yeah, it's an exothermic reaction, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. I don't know who, if we've talked about exothermic yet, but we can start. We call this an exothermic reaction because heat is one of the products. We can also tell that because the reactants are at a higher energy state than the products, okay? So in order, so remember, the only thing that's different between this side and this side is that they're connected to different things, right? So it's not like we're getting rid of some of these things to lower the energy, right? We're not saying, okay, now we don't have this carbon atom anymore, okay? So how are we getting, what's happening? Where is all this energy going, right? That's the question I just asked. That's the question I just asked, and you answered it in a different way. You said that you're feeling the energy come off as heat, okay? So that's what actually happens, is that um, the reaction will get hot, okay? In this case, it'll um, produce fire, you know, and uh, keep uh, going until you get rid of the reactants, okay? But... Also, um, when you do the Bunsen burner reaction or the same reaction as like turning on a gas stove, if you guys got a gas stove at home, um, when I mix oxygen and methane, okay, does just the mixture of oxygen and methane uh, start on fire and get the reaction going? No, what do you have to do to it? You can't just mix those things together and then expect it to go. You have to give it a spark. Yeah, you've got to activate it. Very good, yeah. You've got to activate it, okay? So you've got to give it a bit of external energy, okay? It's like the first time you were on the diving board or something, right? And you didn't want to jump off, but your big brother was there behind you to just give you that little activation energy to get you off of that, right? Because you had a lot of potential energy and now you went down in energy. That's a spontaneous reaction as we know, falling, right? Like this, this is a spontaneous reaction. Why isn't the chalk falling right now? Because I got energy, I'm giving it energy, I'm like not letting it go, okay? So once I let it go, bam, that's like the activation of it, okay? Or me pushing, you know, my little brother or whatever. I don't have a little brother, but pushing my little somebody off of the <laughs> diving board. The kittens, yeah, <laughs> off the diving board. Okay? So here we've got, so this is your reaction, your reactants average energy. So they're just chilling, like in your beaker, just chilling, okay? Or they're coming out of the tube, you're smelling, it's like really smelly of rotten eggs because they just keep coming methane and methane and methane out of there. And somebody's like, you need to like spark that thing before we all blow up, right? Then you're like, oh, that's what I haven't done right, you know? So you get your sparker, ping, okay, you spark it, that's your activation energy, okay? So notice this 
So this axis here, this y-axis is energy. Okay, so we're, this is low energy, this is high energy, this is even higher energy. Okay? This axis here is time, or reaction progression. This is the beginning of the reaction, this will be the end of the reaction. Okay? So, activation energy we call that, and then it just goes down to products. Okay, so let's mark the activation energy. Um, so it's from where the reactant started all the way up to the top there. Okay, we call that the activation energy. And its symbol is EA, like that. So this is activation energy. Oh, it's just, uh, you can think of it as like, this is how they always write it, it's the first letter, the first word at the bottom. But uh, you can think of it as the energy of activation. Okay, so let's talk about an energy diagram specifically. Okay, so an energy diagram uh, states the energy relationship for the, pro uh, for the reaction that are illustrated graphically by diagrams in which the energy of a reaction is graphed on the vertical axis, like we have here, and the progress of the reaction, or over time, is uh, on the horizontal axis. Okay, notice also, this also uh, shows another energy, and that's this energy from here to here. That's the difference between the reactants and the products. And remember, in this reaction, we said we're getting heat out of it. It was 211 kcal or kilojoules or something like that. Um, that is this energy here. And we refer the, to that as delta H. You can think of H as heat. Okay, delta H is the change in heat. Okay, but this stands for this new term called enthalpy. Okay, so this is the enthalpy. I'll write it down. But you can think of it as the change in heat. So delta H is enthalpy. So that's just the energy difference between the reactants and products. So let's just make this a little better here. Like that. Okay, so here you go. Here's another common activation energy that you might be familiar with. Um, maybe if you guys had a jack-o'-lantern last night and lit a match to put a candle inside of it, you know, um, that lighting of the match is the activation energy. Of course, the match has a bunch of stored potential energy in it. How do you know that? Because if you rub it against the thing, what does it do? Yeah, it not only sparks, but like burns, and it'll burn stuff, right? If you stick it on you, it'll burn you. If you <laughs> throw it on like, you know, other things, it'll burn them up, right? It's got a bunch of energy in it, right? So, but you could keep it in a cardboard box, right? You could, that's crazy. That is insane, right? Because like you think about matches, they like burn up cardboard like nobody's business, right? Why is that? Because we haven't given its activation energy yet, okay? So that activation energy is what it takes to get spark. And what do you think? The, the reactants on the tip of the match or the products of that reaction have more energy in them? The reactants? The reactants on the tip or the products after it's done? Has more... The reactants have much more energy. How do you know that? So, 
Oh yeah, all of those things, right? What happens? What happens? It gives off heat. You strike it. It does that. What happens if you strike the the match after it's done burned up? Nothing. Nothing will happen. Huh? Yeah, it'll break all apart, right? Okay. So um, in some reaction mixtures, the average total energy of the molecules is too low at the prevailing temperatures for the reaction to take place at a detectable rate. This or the reaction mixture is said to be stable. Uh, for many stable mixtures, addition of a small amount of energy, just like our match, uh, starts the reaction and continues without the addition of any more stimulus from an outside source until you use up your reactants, of course. Um, and then the small amount of outside energy needed to spark these spontaneous things are activation energy. And then here's the match example. Okay, so you can go back to this energy diagram, the activation energy, the minimum amount of energy required to initiate the chemical reaction. You want to become familiar with uh, the exothermic reaction because we've gone over it quite a bit for quite a bit of the lecture today. Okay, so here's a difference in two reactions. Notice this. This guy's got a low activation energy. So this stuff is almost unstable at those conditions, okay? Right? If it was, if you put this stuff at a, just a little higher temperature, what would happen? It would react, right? Because what is energy and temp or energy and temperature are like what? The same. The same, okay? So if we increase the energy here or increase the temperature, right, this stuff would react, okay? But this stuff, if we increase the temperature just a little bit, would it react? No. no. What about a little bit more? No, no. Because it's got a very high activation energy. Okay? That makes sense, right? Okay, good. Notice here, which has the bigger delta H of these, A or B? A or B? A, right? If you don't know how to do that, watch the lecture again. Okay? Okay. So this reaction is known as an exothermic reaction. Why is that? It's because the reactants are at a higher energy level than the products. So the reactants have more potential energy than the products do. Okay? This is also an exothermic reaction, showing, notice, the reaction mechanism at the top here. Okay? The interesting thing, or not the uh, reaction mechanism, we call this thing here the activated complex, okay? So the activated complex is an intermediate, okay, or a transition state, I should say, a transition state. So this thing doesn't actually exist. It's the transition state between the thing forming and breaking bonds, okay? So if we were to look at our example from earlier, the transition state would be where we've got the carbon, the three hydrogens, and the bond that's about to break, really long and about to break, and the other bond that's about to form, really long and about to form. Okay, this is the transition state. Notice this isn't a molecule, okay? This thing doesn't actually exist. This is like the snapshot of the boxer, like, hitting the other boxer, like right under the chin, the mouthpiece coming out, all of that stuff. You know, this is <laughs> that um, analogy, okay? So at the, uh, at the top of the, so here at the top, you'll get what we call the transition state, okay? Transition state. And that's the transition from the reactants to the products. And notice you can see the kind of dashed bonds here, that's partial bonds. Okay. Notice this says, because it's got a large activation energy, it takes a long time for this reaction to progress. Okay, notice the transition state here. Notice the delta H. Notice the activation energy. 
Well, they have it as the reverse activation energy, so they're looking at it going from oxygen to, so they're saying that this is the reactants here. Okay, and the last thing we want to talk about today before we get to leave is the opposite type of a reaction where the reactants that are, are at a lower energy state than the products. Notice the activation energy of these reactions is very high from way down there to way up there. Huh? Water freezing. Water freezing. Well, it's not a really a reaction. That's a, uh, yeah, but yeah, that'll, that's a good e example of an endothermic process, yeah. Anything, uh, well, not, sorry, well, not water freezing, water melting actually does it, okay? Yeah, so it's, it's a kind of a logic uh, puzzle to think about, but um, it's pretty interesting. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next time. Okay? Um, so you can see the transition state of this one. Okay, endothermic reaction. Notice the high activation energy. Notice in endothermic reactions, your activation energy is going to be bigger than your delta H. Okay, in exothermic reactions, uh, probably won't be. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, you can read over uh, essentially what we've, uh, this is going to be like a kind of bookkeeping uh, page. It talks about everything that we've talked about in this chapter up till now, okay, uh, in terms of uh, rates of reaction. Okay, so thanks for coming today. I'll see you guys on Wednesday, I guess. Or for those of you who are in lab, I'll see you later today. There's some, uh, I have some more blank uh, exam twos up here if, you, if anybody wants them. I don't know. Oh, and there should be a sign-in sheet going around. If you didn't sign in, make sure you do.